What's up guys and welcome back to another one of our creature features here on Shark Lights. The channel members had their say again and decided to vote for the Mega Mouth Shark over the Manta Ray. Why do you lot hate rays, hmm? What did they ever do to you? Anyway, the Shark Lights members do get that choice, so today we've got the mysterious Mega Mouth Shark for our creature feature. And somehow I'm gonna have to talk about this shark species that we barely know anything about for 10 minutes. I'm gonna give it a good go. Right, let's jump in. The Mega Mouth Shark is a large filter feeding pelagic shark species distributed in tropical and temperate oceanic habitats around the world. It's found from the surface of the water all the way down to 1,200 meters deep. And it was first discovered really not that long ago, back in 1976 in Hawaii. Back then, a US research vessel was hauling up a parachute type sea anchor when they noticed a very large, strange looking creature entangled within it. They realized it was a shark pretty quickly, but it wasn't quite like any shark they had seen before. With its enormous mouth and tadpole like body shape, this was a creature that had definitely never ever been seen before. And it was pretty appropriately named by someone there at the time, the Mega Mouth Shark. How imaginative. I like it when the names just make sense. Despite the Mega Mouth Shark being considered large, it's actually the smallest of the three filter feeding shark species. The Whale Shark takes the number one spot, followed by the Basking Shark, and then finally the Mega Mouth Shark. It definitely takes the goofiest face award though. Just look at this weird thing. <laughs> it's kind of giving me zippy vibes from Rainbow. Wow, that, that's a blast from the past. <laughs> did any of you guys watch that weird puppet show when you were younger? Regardless of whether you did or you didn't, I reckon Mega Mouth Sharks are a really dirty, grubby version of Zippy. Anyway, I digress. Although Mega Mouth Sharks are considered the smallest of the filter feeding sharks, that doesn't mean they're small. These heckin' chonkers can reach max sizes of at least eight meters long. That's almost the length of a volleyball net if you play volleyball. If you don't, now you know. Generally though, Mega Mouth Sharks average somewhere between four to five meters, which is still a big fish. And despite being a big fish, these guys feed on the tiniest of marine organisms, plankton and krill. We know this because not a single specimen of this species has been examined who didn't have plankton or krill remnants in its stomach. It's thought that Mega Mouth Sharks slowly swim or float through plankton aggregations with its mouth open wide. Its mouth and jaws then act as if they were a pair of bellows and sucks in anything unfortunate enough to be in the wrong place at the wrong time. Suction feeding is pretty common in the shark world. Basking sharks and whale sharks generally feed with ram filter feeding, which means they just cruise along nice and slow with their mouth wide open. But both of those two species can perform suction feeding as well if they need to. You'll have likely seen clips of whale sharks suction feeding on nets with tiny fish in them. Or some of you might remember the whale shark that was performing suction feeding on the sand because they're just weird like that. <laughs> when scientists started examining mega mouth sharks though, they noticed something strange going on with its upper lip. They discovered that it has a white band on its upper jaw that contrasts with the overall dark black color of the snout and the rest of the upper jaw. The white band is normally hidden in a groove between the snout and the jaw and is only visible when the upper jaw is protruded outwards. Initially there were two different hypotheses as to what this white band was used for. The first was that the Mega Mouth was able to produce light from this band that would attract prey species. And considering they spend most of their time in the deep sea where light is pretty much non-existent, it makes sense. Especially considering how many other bioluminescent species live down there. This hypothesis is strangely repeated throughout the scientific literature in in several publications, despite there actually being no evidence out there currently that proves it to be true. The second hypothesis though was that because the band was white in color, it reflects all wavelengths on the visible spectrum, which means that anything producing light down there would be reflected by the white band, and it again could be a light trap for luring in plankton or other prey species. And it was also suggested that it could be used between mega mouth species as some kind of social communication. Not a single one of those functions, however, was proved until now. Recent research has investigated the denticles of mega mouth sharks in this region of their body, and the scientists found that the white band was completely covered by a calcified coating, which doesn't allow space for any light organs. Which means the mega mouth shark is not a bioluminescent species, and instead the scientists were able to confirm the light reflection hypothesis. The shark, while not being bioluminescent itself, can use the bioluminescence of other species to lure prey towards its mouth 
where it can then just chow down on an easy meal. It's not the only marine species known to do this though. Sperm whales are thought to use the bioluminescence of deep sea plankton to lure squid closer to their mouth where they can just swallow them. Anyway, earlier I said to you that we'd only recently discovered this species about 50 years ago, and as such, it's pretty rare to see one. To date, there's only been around 275 sightings of this mysterious shark. So scientists have had to learn everything they possibly can from a very small number of individuals. And realistically, the majority of those sightings come from three hotspots. If you have a look at this map, you can see where most of the sightings occur. I do have to point out to you though that this map only goes from 1976 when they were discovered to 2018, which is six years out of date. So there's of course been a fair whack of sightings since 2018, but it does give you a general idea of their distribution. Japan, Taiwan, and the Philippines are the three hotspots for the species with multiple records of megamouth sharks. Interestingly, the majority of which are female. This would suggest that this area of the world is perhaps particularly important for breeding, whether it be a breeding hotspot or a place where females go to give birth. We still don't know. To date, there's only been one megamouth shark that has been electronically tagged and tracked. One. That one individual was caught all the way back in 1990, which at the time was only the sixth individual known to science. Megamouth 6 was tracked for just over 50 hours off the coast of California. It's no surprise that it didn't really go that far, traveling about 62 kilometers south towards San Diego. That would give it a swimming speed of just over one kilometer per hour, which does tell us these guys are very slow movers. The tag did reveal some interesting information about its vertical movements though, which is up or down in the water. Column. At nighttime, Megamouth 6 stayed relatively shallow in the water at around 12 to 25 meters deep, whereas during the day, it stayed in deeper waters at around 120 to 166 meters deep. This vertical migration has been reported for other filter feeding shark species, most notably the basking shark, and usually it's directly linked to the movement of their food source, plankton. Every night, the greatest migration on planet Earth takes place in the ocean. During the nighttime, zooplankton migrate up the water column to the surface to feed on smaller phytoplankton. These phytoplankton are concentrated at the surface because they need light to survive and the zooplankton feed under the cover of darkness for their own safety. Then during the daytime, the zooplankton are again wary of predators, so they head to the deep to try and stay hidden. And so it's likely that this dial vertical migration from the megamouth sharks is just simply them following their food. Being so big, it's no wonder they gotta spend most of their time feeding just to be able to eat enough food to sustain their size. Now, if megamouth sharks do follow this dial vertical migration, i.e. they're deep during the day and at the surface at night, it would suggest that we don't see them very often. And that is pretty much the case. The vast majority of sightings for megamouth sharks have come from fisheries. Normally they've been accidentally caught as bycatch in the nets and have been hauled to the surface. Sadly, those megamouth sharks have usually died during the process, but they're always examined by scientists so that we can learn as much as we can about them. But fishery sightings aren't the only time we see these animals. Every Every now and again, some very fortunate individuals get to see megamouth sharks swimming around in their natural environment. There's really only a handful of examples where these sharks have been filmed alive swimming around in the ocean. But when they are caught on film, it's just an epic thing to see. None more epic than the footage that was captured by three fishermen off the coast of San Diego back in 2022. This footage captured by those fishermen documents the only ever time two megamouth sharks have been seen together interacting with each other. The 10 minutes these fishermen spent with the sharks is the only knowledge we have on megamouth sociality. It's rare enough seeing just one of these sharks swimming at the surface, let alone two of them. So massive kudos to the fishermen for getting their phones out and recording this. But not only was it just a cool piece of footage they managed to get, after getting in touch with scientists, a research paper was written because of it. And that was because according to the scientists, the interaction between these two species was most likely a mating behavior. They managed to decipher that the smaller of the two individuals seen here was a male because they could just about see the claspers. And the larger one was likely a female because of no obvious claspers and scars on the back, which are consistent with mating scars among shark species. The male individual can be seen in the footage closely following the female. And because of this, it was concluded, this is likely some kind of courtship display. How cool is that? This is why I'll always tell you guys, if you ever see a shark, start recording it because you you never know what can come of that recording. Now, although 
although we've only had just shy of 300 sightings of megamouth sharks, it has been suggested that these sightings are becoming more common. Before 2008, we had just 40 sightings of this shark, but since then, those megamouth sightings have shot up to nearly 300. The question that remains here, though, is are we actually starting to see more of these shark species, and is their population increasing? Or has something changed in the environment, which means we're now seeing them more commonly? Well, as of currently, there's no conclusive evidence to suggest any of these things. The sudden increase could simply reflect an increase in catches because we're fishing more and more around the world now. Or it could be because megamouth sharks have gained a lot more public attention since 2008 across the world. These days, there's way more people with underwater video cameras or mobile phones that can capture a video or a picture of these animals. And with a photo or a video, the evidence is pretty conclusive. It's either a megamouth shark or it's not. Previously, people might have spotted one, but only been able to loosely describe it, whereas these days with footage of the animal, that ambiguous sighting becomes a reliable one. I think that's probably the most likely reason why it seems like we're seeing more of them. And they're still very much a rare species that you'd be incredibly lucky to spot. They're so rare that we truly have no idea about their population trends. They've recently been listed as least concern on the IUCN red list, but there's a footnote at the bottom that basically says, we're guessing. Hopefully in the years to come, we'll have some more sightings of these animals and be able to actually get a true population assessment for megamouth sharks. Until then, like I always say here on Shark Bites, we're just gonna have to wait and see. Right, okay, that'll do then for megamouths today. What was your favorite megamouth shark fact that you learned? Did you know that one about the white reflective band on the jaw? Regardless of whether you did or you didn't, let me know in the comments. Please do give the video a like if you enjoyed it and make sure you're subscribed to the Shark Bites channel below by clicking that big red subscribe button. But before you head off, if you enjoyed today's creature feature on this weirdo shark, then you should definitely click this video right here. This is our creature feature on the short fin mako shark, considered by many to be one of the most elite shark species out there. It's the strongest, the fastest, and the most intelligent shark species out there. Don't believe me? Make sure you watch the video.